Да, да, да. Okay, maybe I can press the recording and stop. Welcome everyone to Harvard CMSA Quantum Matter in Math and Physics seminar series. It is our great honor, very uh, happy to have Professor Daniel Stuart Fried from U Texas. Uh, Professor Fried is a leader in mathematics and physics, working on geometry, topology, and uh, uh, quantum field theory. As I heard from his anonymous students say that uh, Professor Free was regarded, is regarded by mathematician working in physics, but also regarded by physicists working in mathematics. I think he worked on both math and physics deeply, and also mathematical physics, and also physical mathematics. Today, he will be speaking about topological symmetry in field theory. Let me remind the audience, please feel free to interact with uh, Professor Fried and ask questions during his talk. So we will just uh, have Professor Fried speaking now. Thank you. Please take over. Thank you, Jovan. Uh, and thanks to CMSA for hosting and inviting me here today. And I'll just reiterate that please do interrupt uh, with questions. And if you feel so moved, you can also show me your face. That would be also very nice. So what I'll talk about today is uh, joint work with Greg Moore and Constantine Telemann. And it's part of this uh, Simon's collaboration on global categorical symmetry, which started a little over a year ago. And just before that, we decided, started discussions thinking that we should know what global categorical symmetry means and think about um, the kind of general framework for understanding that. So symmetry in quantum field theory is, of course, a very big topic. And today, we're only going to touch on a very small piece of that. And in particular, what we'll talk about are internal symmetries, what you might call global symmetries, internal symmetries in quantum field theory. And the talk really will introduce and illustrate a little bit of framework uh, in which to understand and manipulate uh, such symmetries. So the examples that I'll show you are finite symmetries. And in the paper that's referenced, most of the examples are also finite symmetries. But I'll indicate at some point a direction in which this should generalize. I want to say at the beginning that what we include are not just finite groups, ordinary finite groups, but higher homotopical groups, two groups, all sorts of uh, different symmetries, algebras of symmetries that have nothing to do with, uh, that aren't just restricted to ordinary groups. And most importantly, the framework I'm going to say leads to a kind of calculus of defects. And that calculus of defects will take full advantage of what we know about topological field theory. There have been many developments um, you know, in the foundations and so on. Now there's a very big structure of theorems and a framework computations and so on. And this framework for symmetries in quantum field theories, where the quantum field theories aren't necessarily topological, uh, allows us to leverage all that work. So again, we're going to make clear the topological character of the symmetry. We're going to separate out, in a sense, the topological piece and as I say, we'll look at some particular examples of this, examples that are well known in the literature, but we'll look at it from this viewpoint. 
So the talk is largely really an introduction to this paper. And um, there are also lecture notes from a summer school course I gave. And the example I'll do at the end is taken from those lecture notes. But sadly, as I was preparing this talk, I realized some of the writing there is far from optimal and a few uh, wrong statements, but I didn't have time to correct it. But hopefully I'll do that at some point. In any case, I want to begin uh, in a very different place with something that has no field theory at all, but something uh, from representation theory, just as a motivation. So let's consider these three matrices. These form a basis for the Lie algebra SL2R. And you can easily verify in your head, I'll give you a second to do it, that this identity holds where the product and sum are products and sums of matrices. So that's a little calculation in two by two matrices. And by now you've all done it. And you found that it's the scalar matrix multiplication by three halves. So that's an identity not in SL2R, right? Because this matrix, for example, does not have trace zero. So the product is not happening in SL2R, but it's happening in two by two matrices. Well, we could look at the three dimensional representation of SL2R and we now have these corresponding matrices representing these basis elements of the Lie algebra SL2R. And we can look again at the same identity. And now it's a computation in three by three matrices. So here you'll have to trust me on this one. And we still get a scalar matrix. Now the scalar is four. Well, you can imagine the next slide might be the four by four case, five by five and so on. We have representations, finite dimensional representations of all those dimensions. And we'll still find that this identity holds, but instead let's look at an infinite dimensional representation. So the group SL2R, the Lie group SL2R, in fact, it's quotient PSL2R, acts by projective transformations on the real projective line. So this picture is a very classical one in projective geometry showing you a projective transformation. So these are the fractional linear transformations if we write a formula uh, in terms of coordinates. Anyway, it acts on the projective line. So by pullback, it acts on differentials. And we'll take differentials where lambda is uh, could be any complex number. So that's an infinite dimensional vector space. This is a linear representation. And if I computed correctly, here's the infinitesimal action of the Lie algebra. These three elements act. Now they act by first order differential operators. And um, these are they, these are the differential operators. The parameter lambda, of course, enters into the formulas. And we can check this same identity. So now the square means the composition of these differential operators. And so each side is a second order differential operator. But in fact, all the derivative terms cancel. And each side is just multiplication, again, by this scalar. Well, of course, we don't have to do every separate computation. The identity that we're talking about is a single identity. And where does it take place? Well, it takes place in the universal enveloping algebra of this Lie algebra. So that's the universal associative unital algebra that um, has the Lie algebra in it, and where the commutator in this algebra, AB minus BA, is equal to the bracket in the Lie algebra. So any computation we do in this abstract algebra applies in any module over this algebra, which is to say it applies to any representation of SL2R. And so this identity is very easy in the universal enveloping algebra. All we're using is what I said, that the bracket in the Lie algebra is the commutator in uh, the associative algebra, this universal enveloping algebra. And if you just substitute then this relation for EF, you get the other side. So it's not even a one line computation. But having done that, then the computations, whether with matrices or with differential operators, they have to work out. And that in a nutshell is the talk. The idea is to use this, is to find an abstract place in field theory where one can make these kinds of computations with symmetries. Instead of elements of the algebra will have defects. And um, those computations will then hold in every quantum field theory 
for which that's a symmetry. So the idea is to formulate that and illustrate it. So here um, is a list, I'm sorry if uh, it's not complete, but it's a list of uh, people that have worked, written papers recently, the last several years on these kinds of notions of symmetry in QFT. And in many of these papers, you'll find the kinds of computations I just showed you. They won't be matrices, they won't be differential operators, but they're computations in a particular module, if you like, in a particular theory, rather than uh, computations in an abstract place. And so the goal, as I say, is to do that. Make universal computations of this sort with symmetries in quantum field theory. Okay, so here's a little bit of uh, terminology. So the word symmetry, when I think of symmetry, I think back to first learning about symmetry, symmetries in nature. A symmetry is something where you transform some object, eventually ma uh, abstract mathematical objects, but concretely, you know, honeycombs and shapes in nature. And usually you can transform back. That's what it means to be a symmetry. It means that you have the same object once you transform it. So that usually refers to groups. And of course, we have the notion of the abstract group that tells us about these symmetries. But here we're going to use more algebras. And so we could talk about algebras of symmetries. And indeed, algebras have been part of quantum mechanics from the first days. Von Neumann, who was very much involved in the late 20s, early 30s with developing quantum mechanics, simultaneously was developing algebras, in that case, topological algebras like uh, C star algebras, von Neumann algebras in um, in mathematics, but because of their application to field theory, uh, to quantum mechanics at that time. So, um, so non-invertible symmetries, which is to say non-units in an algebra, non-invertible elements, that's something that's been there from the beginning in quantum mechanics. But again, I want to emphasize that we'll be um, doing the analog of really algebras. It incorporates groups, uh, as we'll see, by a construction like the group algebra, but the framework itself is more like algebras. So let's then think about algebras in just a very elementary way. And I want to separate out um, some abstract version of symmetry and a concrete version, meaning its action. So the abstract version is a pair consisting of an algebra, and you can just think very simple, finite dimensional, non-topological algebra, like a matrix algebra or some of matrix algebras, for example, the group algebra of a finite group. And R here is a module. It's a right module, and it's the regular module. What does regular mean? It means that the underlying vector space is the vector space A, and A acts on the right just by the, by the multiplication inside the algebra. So if you like, it's forgetting part of the algebra structure, but remembering the right action on itself as a vector space. So this is the abstract data, I wanna say this pair. And now what does it mean to give the action on a vector space? That's a linear representation of this uh, symmetry data. Well, again, it's a pair. So now it's a pair of a left module for A and an isomorphism theta that says that when I take the, um, this kind of sandwich where I take the right module and the left module and I tensor over A in the middle, that what I get back is the vector space V. And if you just think about, um, well, if we write A for the vector space R, A tensor over A with L is, we usually write L. But when we're writing this, this A is the vector space A viewed as a right module, and this L is the vector space underlying the left module. So I've written it here, keeping track of exactly that structure. And uh, we'll depict it like this. That, as I say, is a sandwich with the algebra in the middle. The right module, notice it's on the left in the picture, but that's because the algebra acts on the right. So quite generally, I think of right actions in geometry and here as structural and left actions as more geometric. And so this right module is part of the structure, this abstract symmetry structure. The left one, the action on the left, is the geometric action on whatever we're acting on. Okay, 
So it is a little bit pedantic here to separate them out. I certainly readily admit that. But when we go to the field theory context, we'll see in uh, at least one example, but there are many, many, in which the um, right module looks quite different from the algebra. So it's really a separate piece of data. OK. So again, any relation that we find in the algebra, so now elements of the algebra act as operators on the vector space V. That's what it means to say V is endowed with the left module structure. And um, any relations in the algebra become relations in those operators. That's what I illustrated at the beginning with the universal enveloping algebra. So the analogy that we'll develop is we're going to replace in the field theory context, we're going to replace the abstract algebra by a topological field theory. And elements of the algebra will be replaced by defects in the topological field theory. Okay. So just to be sure, here's an example of an algebra. If we have a finite group, then this is the group algebra formal linear combinations of the group elements with coefficients in, well, in this case, the complex numbers. And the product you can think of as, you can think of these elements as functions on the group and we push forward under multiplication. But we also have in mind higher examples, higher in the sense of categories, higher algebra or higher category level. And so here we can make out of this group, we can also make a group algebra with coefficients not in the, in the field of complex numbers or the ring of complex numbers, but rather in a kind of categorical ring, which is vector spaces. So we take the category of finite dimensional vector spaces, and those have an addition, direct sum, a product, a tensor product. And so we can make the same kind of convolution that we do with functions replacing the product by tensor product here and the sum by direct sum. And so what we get is a marriage of a category and an algebra, a tensor category. Excuse me, Dan? Yes. Earlier you make an analogy to replace algebra to topological field theory. Uh, how do we know how do we know how to do that? I'm, what going, kind of... to tell, I'm going to tell you. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Other questions? Okay, so let me say just a quick bit about field theory and the framework we use. And roughly, there's an analogy. You can think of a field theory from this point of view as being analogous to a representation of a Lie group. But here I'm not thinking of that Lie group as symmetries. I'm thinking of it as something else. And as it says, the analogy is quite limited, one shouldn't take it too far, but for basic structural things, it's not a bad um, way to think. And so what I'm really referring to is this axiom system that was introduced by Graham Siegel in uh, the mid 1980s in the context of two dimensional conformal field theory. And then uh, shortly after that, Atiyah um, adapted it to topological field theory. And now it's really a framework to think about all field theories, I would say. And so there are two kinds of discrete parameters that tell us what type of field theory it is. One is the dimension of uh, the theory, which is the dimension of space time. And the second are the kinds of background fields you have. So there are no fluctuating fields in this description. And the background fields might be topological, like an orientation or a spin structure. They might be geometric, like a Riemannian metric or a conformal structure. And then what we get is a, um, is a map from this Bordism category or multi-category into some target. So to a co-dimension one manifold, manifold of dimension n minus one that's closed, again, with all these background fields, we will assign a um, usually a vector space or in the infinite dimensional case, some kind of topological vector space. And then when you have a Bordism, you get a linear map of these vector spaces. So I'm sure that's very familiar. And um, we want to say that it's fully local in the topological case where we can really cut in all co-dimensions. And for general theories, well, that's a subject for development. But in principle, 
um, one would think that. And I'll just point out that uh, there is a paper not so long ago by Maxim Konsevich and Graham Siegel in which they prove, well, an analog of the Osterwald or Schrouder theorem, but they also talk about this kind of axiom system when you have uh, honest quantum field theories that aren't topological or aren't conformal. Okay. So again, a little bit of terminology and concepts in general field theory. So these sigmas here are going to be dimension n plus one. And we can talk about, the dimension isn't relevant for this slide, I guess. We can talk about a domain wall between two theories. And so that's pictured here. That's this arrow tells us the direction of the domain wall. That's a map from sigma one to sigma two. But in the context of the, um, of the bordisms, what it means is that we allow manifolds that now have some kind of color to think co-dimension one manifold, and we label the complements either one or two, and then we can evaluate the theory on those kinds of bordisms. So it's really a shorthand for saying we have a theory on a bigger bordism category, and that encodes this domain wall delta. And in the special case, when one or the other of the theories is the tensor unit theory, then um, this is a boundary. And so on this side, this is a right boundary, and on this side, it's a left boundary. So instead of using these terms, domain wall boundary theory, boundary theory, right and left, I'll often use the terms from algebra, which is we have a bimodule, a right module, and a left module. And if we have both a right and left module, a right and left boundary theory, then again, we can form this sandwich, which I'll write again as this algebra notation, this tensor product. But now the tensor product means the n-dimensional theory you get by dimensionally reducing sigma, this n plus one dimensional theory uh, along this interval where the interval has these boundary theories, the right and left boundary theories. So that's now an absolute n-dimensional theory, doesn't live on the boundary of anything, stands alone. And we'll write that as this tensor product. So that's the mixing or the sandwich of the left and right uh, boundary theories over sigma. And we can have defects. These domain walls and boundaries are examples of defects. We could have defects of higher co-dimension those were co-dimension one defects. And the defects could be supported on uh, submanifolds or you know, stratified manifolds that are sitting inside your manifold M. And we'll see some simple examples of uh, those kinds of defects. Okay. So there's a composition law on theories if the theories have the same domain, meaning the same dimension and the same background fields, then there's a composition law where we can tensor them or stack them, it's sometimes called. So it's combining them in a quantum way without any interaction. And there's a unit for that composition law, which is the theory that assigns, for example, the one-dimensional vector space C to every co-dimension one manifold, the number one to every closed top dimensional manifold, et cetera. So it just assigns at every stage the tensor unit. And there's also a composition law on defects, as long as the defects are, so to speak, parallel. So if you have point defects, those are usually called local operators, maybe in quantum field theory, there's a composition law, but it doesn't lead to an algebra. It really leads to the operator product expansion. But in a topological theory, that leads to an honest algebra. And the same in a topological theory with, uh, with higher dimensional defects, there's a way to combine them and you get some kind of algebra of defects or a higher algebra of defects. And again, there's a unit. The unit in this case is sometimes called the transparent defect. It means we can erase it. So if we have a composition law, which is associative, as these are in a suitable sense, and it has a unit, mean, unit in this case meaning identity element for the composition, then we have a notion of invertibility. So both for field theories with its composition law, 
And for defects with its composition law, we have a notion of an invertible field theory and an invertible defect. Okay, so this is a good place for questions if there are any. Okay, so um, let me now give the main definition. And just as I did for algebras, where I told you there was an abstract version of symmetry, a pair of an algebra and a right module, and then the realization of that abstract symmetry as a left module structure and a certain isomorphism, that will be exactly parallel here. So this slide well, maybe is... Yes. I, I, maybe I, I don't know, what, should I interrupt? Just because you are... So I have a question about, it seems like a previous discussion is pretty general, but uh, you start with saying the talk will be focused on finite finite symmetry, finite well, I'm group. Getting or, there now. Huh? I'm getting so, so there I was, now. I was just giving some terminology and framework, so we're on common ground when I'm talking about field theory. No problem. So that was so. so I agree. Okay. So yeah, the previous discussion is pretty general. Then more than fine. Yeah, thank you. Correct. Yeah, thank you. Um, is the topological theory in the middle supposed to be fully extended? The answer is, uh, sorry, I'm reading the question from the chat. The answer is yes. In principle, we should think of it as fully local, I would say, meaning it goes down fully. I'll make a comment about going up fully, but down in dimension, meaning we have invariance when we cut in all dimensions. I think in principle, we want to think that for any uh, field theory. It's not true, of course. There are examples of topological theories that we don't know how to do that. But um, the ones that occur in physics, I think we want to think there's a very strong locality, whether it be for the theories that are encoding symmetry or the actual quantum field theories. Okay, so I said that there are these discrete parameters n, the dimension of space-time, and f, the background fields that tell you which type of theory, and we're going to keep those fixed, but often implicit. And so now here's the abstract symmetry structure. And it's a pair consisting of uh, a topological field theory sigma, which has dimension n plus one, and rho, which is a right module, a right boundary theory. And again, rho is topological. So both of these are topological, that's important. And sigma again is one more dimension than the dimension of the, we're studying symmetry in. And this row, it's right, so it's part of the structure. It's, um, it's topological. So everything in this picture belongs to topological field theory. Now we introduce the word quiche uh, for this concept because this is in a sense, a kind of open face sandwich. You see, we're going to put eventually something there to close the sandwich. So we had to think of a word, maybe a word, quantum word, that describes the structure, so we're calling this a quiche. Although one of our good friends wrote us after the paper appeared and said, yes, an open face sandwich is a tartine, not a quiche. Be that as it may, we're calling it a quiche. Okay, so that's the basic definition. So for example, for a finite group, how is that encoded? Well, sigma is going to be the finite uh, gauge theory, just the gauge theory where we count G bundles. It's the gauge theory in dimension N plus one. And again, the G bundles are not background. It's the theory where we've summed over G bundles. So it's the kind of quantum theory. The G bundle was a fluctuating field and it's summed. So it doesn't appear in the theory sigma. I, I mean, it's used to define sigma, but sigma, as far as the background fields you need for sigma, you don't need any at all. You don't need an orientation, nothing. It's just defined on general manifolds. Now in the algebra case, I said that we wanted rho to be the regular module. And here too, it makes sense to ask that rho be regular, but that's a little bit more technical to try to say what that is. And here, I'll leave it for a second to read. If we have a fully extended theory, and if the codomain, which we have to choose to tell what kind of theory it is, if the codomain has is an n plus one category whose objects are algebras in an n category, 
then what's attached to a point is an algebra, a higher algebra inside this n category C prime. And then it makes sense to talk about the right regular module for this A. And given enough finiteness or dualizability, that by the cobordism hypothesis determines a row. So again, I'm not going to insist today on that, but, um, but just to tell you that, again, with all the developments in topological field theory, we know how to say what a right regular module is, at least under certain conditions. Okay, and there's more about that in the paper. So sometimes this kind of boundary theory is called Dirichlet, but this is perhaps a more restrictive use of uh, that term. Okay, now let me address again the question about sigma being fully extended. I said it's fully local in the sense we can go down, but we're talking about symmetries of an n-dimensional theory. And from that point of view, there's no uh, reason that sigma has to be defined on n plus one manifolds. So it's perfectly good if sigma is a theory that doesn't go all the way to the top. So it's again an n-dimensional theory but what it assigns to an n-manifold is not a number, but rather a vector space, typically. And so it's enough to make this theory if we assume sigma is of that type. And that means that in the topological field theory framework, that sigma of a point can have less dualizability, and that leads to less finiteness, and that opens the door for having um, discussing symmetries that go beyond finite symmetries. So this notion was introduced, um, for example, by Stoltz and Teichner, and also by um, myself and Konstantin. They use the term twists uh, for this kind of uh, middle theory and maybe not quite the boundary theories. But what we call boundary theories in this case are um, relative field theories. So sorry, I think the twist here was referring to the sigma, not to the boundary theory. And you can do defects in these once categorified theory but when you do defects, then the link is not a sphere, which it usually is for a submanifold, but you have to do something a little different because you don't quite have the top dimension. So again, I'm not going to say more about that in this talk. I just wanted to indicate that there is a direction to extend uh, beyond the kinds of finite examples that I'm discussing here. Okay, so let me go then to the um, second part of the definition. The first part is this abstract notion, that's this quiche, this pair sigma rho. So that has a dimension we're calling an n-dimensional quiche, but remember sigma is either a full n plus one dimensional topological theory or this truncated version of once categorified n-dimensional theory. And now what's it going to act on? Well, it's going to act on an n-dimensional quantum field theory, n-dimensional field theory. So that's this F, that's what we wanna act on. That's analogous to the vector space we were acting in algebra on. And so what is the structure of that action making F into a module? Well, it's a pair in which this F tilde here is literally a left boundary theory for sigma or a left sigma module. And then when we make this sandwich like this, that dimensional reduction, remember, which is now an n-dimensional theory, we have to get back F. So we have to specify this isomorphism that tells us how the underlying theory is F. So again, the role of this right module, this right sigma module, that piece of structure, is to be able to recover the underlying theory F. Okay, So that's the definition. I'll give examples. And can I just get a clarification? Which yep. of them is an absolute theory with your definition? F or F tilde or F. is it only F? F is an absolute theory. F tilde is on the boundary of sigma. But if we squash sigma and combine a touch row very close to F tilde, is it the same as F? Is F tilde the same as F? No, I'll no, you'll see we, the if we bring row. Imagine we can consider the whole left-hand side with rho, sigma, and f tilde. Yes. But the interior, I think, is topological. Both sigma and rho are topological. Right, so there's no notion of distance between rho and f tilde. Correct. So if I just squash it and assume it's it's small, is it the yes. same as f? 
Well, if by squashing you mean this dimensional reduction, that's what this says. It's not literally the same. We have to give an isomorphism that tells you. But yes, if we so that's make... what I don't see. Well, I often make this mistake that I think the same and isomorphism are the same, are equivalent, but they are not. But specifically here, well, what, what does this uh, arrow mean? I'll just say the set of two children, if you think the two are the same, or is the isomorphism really matters. But um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> What does it mean here? I mean, yeah, sorry, ask again, Nati. Well, the two children are not the same and they're not isomorphic. But oh, but the, but, the, but the correspondence with the set one, two is also important in some contexts, is all I was saying. Anyway, go ahead. So imagine I just entered the talk now and I just saw that and I would ask myself, what's the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side? Is there any difference? Um, sure, there's a difference. Um, I'll answer it maybe with the second example I'm going to give in a second. In okay. the second okay. example, F will be a certain gauge theory for a certain gauge group, and F tilde will be a gauge theory with a different gauge group. But combining them, we'll get the gauge theory with the gauge group of F. So that example might make it a little bit clearer if you can wait. If okay. You Okay, thanks. Other question? Um, I think it's follow up to Nati's question. Uh, here, you say sigma and rho are topological, but they are different type of topological. Even for topological field theory, there could be invertible or non-invertible field theory. Am I correct if sigma is invertible and perhaps even a trivial element in the cobordism group classification, and rho is a trivial gap boundary? In that case, F tilde and F will be exactly the same. However, if sigma is either non-trivial invertible TFT or non or non-invertible TFT, and also the rule can be a, a different type of topological gap boundary, then the the, the map between the two between the left hand side and right hand side actually is 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 not exactly equivalent. I don't know whether, whether well, I mean, uh, let's I try to classify what, what sigma and rho being topological, they could be different different kinds. Well, if sigma is invertible and if rho exists, then, um, well, if sigma is invertible, I mean, that can happen, but typically we wouldn't call that symmetry. And if sigma is the trivial theory, then, you know, it's like saying that a vector space has the action of the one element group. I mean, it's no information. So yes, it's an example, but it's it's not information. And an invertible theory that might not be trivial in the sense that quantum theory is projective, it's more or less the same. So you shouldn't think that sigma is invertible and typically. In the example I gave you with the finite group, unless the group is the group of one element, then when you take the finite gauge theory, that won't be invertible either. So the typical example, sigma is not invertible. Okay. So uh, where are we? Yeah. So again, one of the main points is that this presentation, think of this left-hand side as a presentation of the theory F, and it's a presentation that makes manifest this part of the symmetry. It's not a statement, these are all the symmetries or all the topological defects. It's making manifest this part of the symmetry. And this part of the picture is topological. The non-topological piece is happening here. So any manipulations we make in this part of the picture will be part of topological field theory. And that's what we can do. Okay. Sorry, well, how, how are you defining you're saying the field theories are not topological, but then what does field theory mean if it's yeah, not it's topological? It's a good question. <laughs> it's the question, do I know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about this part of the picture? So here, I'm. Um, this part is indeed, if you back me to a corner, I would certainly say this is heuristic and not rigorous. We're long-term kind of goal to, to do that, to understand non-topological field theories in a good framework. What I'm saying is that all of the kinds of manipulations and the 
what we'll do it happens here where we do know uh, solid uh, foundations for doing them and we're applying them to the non-topological make non you know statements about non-topological theories but there's no claim that there's a um, you know rigorous foundation to that part of the theory I hope that's clear so so the quiche will be the kind of definition of the symmetry and then this is a more heuristic picture of what it means for a field theory to have the symmetry is that right well yes i mean in the sense that you know however you want to think of yes it's a more heuristic picture because you know do we have a definition like this well i can start to make a definition as a representation of some boardism category with you know metrics and so on and then we'll need a lot more kinds of uh, things to say, some of which are said in the, as I said, the Conceived Siegel paper, but there's no pretense that that's a well-developed theory. Okay. But um, just as in other contexts, we try to pick out parts of field theory, for example, anomalies that we can use um, you know, different tools in geometry and algebra and so on to, to say something about, then that's what we're doing here. That makes sense. Right, yeah, thanks. Okay, good. Thanks for the question. Okay, so this is an important point, but I won't nearly have time to get to any example. That symmetry, the same way one uses anomalies, symmetry is meant to persist under renormalization group flow. And so, if you're, um, if you have this presentation of your theory F as this uh, kind of sandwich and we flow the theory F, then this theory F tilde should also flow and where it flows to should also then be a left module and fit into this picture. And that can lead to you know, restrictions, particularly if the theory F is gapped and you think it flows to a topological field theory. So that's important. There are examples in the paper, but I just won't have time today. Okay, so let me give you a couple of examples illustrate this, and hopefully that will clear up uh, Nati's kind of question. So the first example is quantum mechanics, where n is 1. And this really looks like the algebra case. So quantum mechanics is given by having a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian, say. And the background fields are then an orientation and Riemannian metric, at least for these, field, for these theories. And we're supposing we have a finite group acting on the Hilbert space linearly, which commutes with the Hamiltonian. So in other words, the, the G axis symmetries. And in that case, the sigma is the two-dimensional G gauge theory, whose value on a point is the group algebra. If we take values in algebras, this F on a point is the vector space H, the state space. And this F tilde on a point is that same state space, but regarded as a module over the group algebra, remembering the group algebra. So again, it looks like the algebra case and there's not much there. Let me skip that. And here's the example that uh, hopefully clarifies a little bit better. So- Can I have one thing? Uh, just quickly, whether there are any concrete example of not, not even mention in detail, but I just say in your work, when is there some example you, you know that F tilde or F being Gabli theory or CFT that, that can be discussed concretely in, in this setting? Is there such a understanding you, you think is possible to do that when F tilde and F are gapless, massless, or CFT? Well, I can say that it's the framework would apply. It doesn't prejudice whether F is uh, gapped or gapless. But the substance of the question was that makes it transparent or concrete. I'm not sure that I have anything to say about that. I, I think it would, I, I hope it makes the symmetry more transparent and concrete and manipulable. Um, that's the point, and I think- I'd like to follow that. So when we take a CFT, say one plus one dimensions, which has a global symmetry, then we can consider different theories depending on whether we do or do not gauge that global symmetry. Oberfeld is an example. And then I believe that all of them have the same F tilde, but changing rho will produce right. different Fs. Yes, and I'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. 
That's correct. But we're starting to say that so the original example, so I'm just trying to address Juven's point. He asked whether there is a gapless example. So here is a gapless example. Free scalar field in one plus one dimensions is an example. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so let me go to this example, which will illustrate how F and F tilde really can look different. So here we're in any dimension, really. And A is a finite abelian group. So for example, this is the group plus or minus one, the cyclic group of order two written multiplicatively. And now um, we can take the classifying space BA, whatever world you want to think of a classifying space. And this is also a group if A is abelian. And it's a, um, and this is the abstract group that expresses what is typically called a one form asymmetry. It's, it's a BA symmetry. It's the symmetry of this group. Now, what kind of theory does it act on? Well, it might act on a gauge theory where the gauge group is H, that's a Lie group. And this finite abelian group A is a subgroup of the center of this Lie group. So for example, if the Lie group is SU2, this group plus or minus one is the complete center of SU2. And we'll let H bar be the quotient group, which is in that example, SO3. So now we wanna say that gauge, well, it depends on the gauge theory, of course, whether this is a symmetry, but we're imagining that there's a gauge theory with that symmetry. So here's again, the abstract symmetry. There's a version of rho that I'll get to later. And um, so the F is this H gauge theory, SU2 gauge theory, but we want to express that it has the symmetry. And in that case, what goes on this boundary is actually SO3 gauge theory. But when we make this sandwich, what we're effectively doing is this is gauge fixing. It's trivializing the double cover, which is expressing this symmetry. <clears throat> and so, sorry, it's trivializing the gerb, the shifted uh, double cover, which is specifying the symmetry. And basically you're summing over SO3 bundles with a trivialized W2, and that means you're summing over SU2 bundles. The way in which this sandwich or this uh, mixing tensor product uh, becomes this SU2 gauge theory. So here you really do see something non-trivial happening and in particular that F and F tilde look different. So I hope that example is clarifying uh, for that. And it shows you an example of a higher symmetry that can be encoded by the same sigma and rho. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes. So in, in this case also F tilde is an absolute theory. We could regard in that case F tilde as an absolute theory, but um, but that's a different story, right? So your thing is not necessary to regard F tilde as an absolute theory. No, here it's important that I regard it as a left module, meaning a left boundary theory for sigma. Otherwise I won't be able to form the dimensional reduction. So I need so, to remember that structure. So for example, it's not necessary that you specify which gauge group uh, uh, F tilde uh, has, for example, it can be also SU2. It... No, not if it's to be on the boundary of this, no. No, it wouldn't be SU2, no. So it's, 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 not, it's not a theory with a specification of a gauge algebra, it's really a theory of the specification of gauge group. Yes, it's important to give the gauge group in these theories. I mean, I want the theory. The theory knows the group, yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, the theory, sorry, the construction knows the group. I mean, a given gauge theory, it might have a presentation that's not a gauge theory at all, all these dualities. So I'm not saying you can read that off from the quantum theory, but I'm saying if we describe it this way, a Lagrangian construction, path integral, and so on, then yes, the group enters that construction. Okay, so as Nadi mentioned, we can start to put other topological theories on and for this right module, and then we would construct uh, other theories here. So here, the logic is that we started with F. We want to say it has this symmetry, 
that's expressed by this isomorphism theta. But now having done that, we can construct new theories, for example, quotients gauging the symmetry by putting appropriate other topological right models there. So we'll see that later if we get there. Okay, so now I wanna talk about defects in this kind of calculus of defects. And I'm going to illustrate it here in a very simple example. Hopefully I'll get to a more interesting example, but the principles are already evident in this example, which is why I belabor it. And so this is the example of quantum mechanics again, n equals one, where we have a group G acting on the state space commuting with the Hamiltonian. So if we just consider this theory without the symmetry, how do we compute defects supported on a submanifold or a stratified submanifold? Well, we look at the link. The link is the unit sphere in the normal bundle. So in this case, it's two points, it's the zero sphere. And we evaluate the theory on that sphere. And if it's not topological, we have to take a limit, an inverse limit, as the um, as that link shrinks. And what we evaluate is the theory, but what labels the defect, what is the defect, sometimes I call it the label, is something in HOM from one to the defect. So it doesn't make sense to say an element of this, but we have to say it's an object in this category. So this is always a category of some sort, even in the higher situation, and it's always HOM from one to that. So if we do that in this quantum mechanical case, then what we get by evaluating on the zero sphere is something like H tensor, it's a dual, which is something like endomorphisms of H. But if H is infinite dimensional, then we have to worry about questions of topology and so on. And when we take this inverse limit, we're going to get operators on H, but they'll be very singular. And that's what you expect in quantum mechanics. You expect, in general, you expect observables to be very singular. And so that's in fact what happens here. And that you can read more about in the Conceived Siegel paper. But uh, we're going to focus not on the analytic aspect. And so what we want to do is use this isomorphism. This is the isomorphism theta. We want to use it to study defects, these point defects here, by transporting them, well, by transporting from here certain defects, which might be lines here, <coughs> with boundary and transporting them to point defects here. So let's see how that looks. Well, one thing we might have is a point defect supported on this other boundary. So again, this is topological, this is the row. And what do we do? Well, we will look at its link. Its link now is not a circle, but its link is a interval like this. That's the link inside this geometry. And that's this interval with these two endpoints, the endpoints being this regular boundary theory. And now you evaluate this in the theory sigma rho. And what you get is the vector space A. So you get the vector space underlying this uh, group algebra. So in other words, what labels this defect or what is the defect supported on this point is an element of the algebra A. So in particular, it might be a group element. Those are units in the algebra, but there are plenty of non-units as well. And so those transport the point defects here, and those are definitely topological. And that's the usual statement that uh, a co-dimension one defect, sorry, that a group defect is given by a co-dimension one uh, submanifold labeled by a group element. So those are among these defects. Well, if we go to the other side, then here we're not going to get topological defects. We have to do a similar thing. And what ends up is that you get operators on the Hilbert space that commute with the symmetry. Those are the ones that can be expressed as points supported on this boundary. So they're not topological, the ones supported here, that's a non-topological part of the theory. What about a point defect in the middle? Well, now the link is a circle. And so we have to evaluate the two-dimensional gauge on a circle, that's well known. What you get is the center of the group algebra. So in particular, if you have a central element of the group, you can label it by a central element, just a single group element Z. Or you might take the sum of elements in a conjugacy class of G, that's a central element of the group algebra. And well, those are the elements you might 
output here. So those are kind of central defects. And again, they're topological because they're living in this topological part of the theory. So how do we get a general point defect in this theory, which is a general operator? Well, here we'll have to take an interval like this. So this is now a stratified manifold, a manifold with boundary. And the way we have to compute defects supported here is to start with the highest dimensional stratum, compute its link. Whoops, sorry, its link is now two points, the zero sphere. And then we have to go to the link here. The link here is again an interval, but it involves this higher dimensional stratum. So we'll need to know what we assigned there in order to evaluate that, et cetera. And so in this case, what you find is that the label in the middle, the defect in the middle is labeled by a bimodule. At this end, we get a vector in the vector space underlying the bimodule. And at this end, we get a bimodule map like that. And you can combine this data, take T of XC, and you get an operator, and that's what transports under the isomorphism theta. So, um, so that's the general defect. Again, it's not going to be uh, topological unless uh, you know this part isn't here. You can kind of retract it to the topological piece. Okay. Here's a picture of composition laws. If we have two row point defects or two sigma point defects, again, they're supported in the, um, in the topological part of the picture. So for the sigma defects, that's the familiar picture. We want to take these two points and bring them close together and then combine them. And we follow the links as we make this movie of bringing them together. And the links, well, make two circles that fuse to a figure eight, and make one circle. So that's, of course, this pair of pants. And so in the topological theory, if we evaluate the pair of pants, that gives us the composition law that brings together these two point defects. And similarly, if we have two point defects on this boundary row, we bring them together in this sequence of pictures. And we watch what happens to the links here. And it's two intervals that come together and fuse. And that's like this. These intervals come together and fuse into one interval. And that's the pair of chaps. So the pair of pants, the pair of chaps are giving us these composition laws. And of course, there's analogous uh, pictures in higher dimensions. OK, so here's a very simple example of computation. You can make, um, you can see about commutation relations. So if we look at the defects in the theory F, which isn't presented here, but what is presented is this sandwich picture, this mixing picture of the theory F, then we have these three different kinds of point defects in the theory F. And for example, a defect supported here, remember that could be labeled by an arbitrary element of the group algebra, or for example, an element of the group, that clearly commutes with any defect supported here because this can move up and down, this is topological. This stays fixed because you should think of this as like time or wick rotated time. And so this can't move, it's not topological, but this part can move. And so clearly when I project over here, we can have it either before or after this non-topological defect. So that's the sense in which th this is a symmetry. It commutes with those operators. Well, these operators commute with G is what it says. The ones in the middle, remember, are the center of the group. They also commute with these group elements. They commute with these operators. They commute with everything. But if we want to compute now, for example, how a general group element moves past a uh, general algebra element, that's a computation we can do using those composition laws. And well, you just see that the algebra element conjugates. Um, we can also move this group element past a general a point operator, point defect in the quantum mechanics, because that's the same computation we just did. It's all happening in the topological piece. And so the picture in the quantum mechanics is what's pictured below here. That's the picture in the actual quantum mechanics. You have your, um, whatever observable you have here, you have your symmetry operator and we're commuting them in time. And you see that that changes this operator by this kind of conjugation. So I'm not going to stress the details just to show you that that's a computation that's happening in this topological part. So it's 
to answer Dominique's question. It's a rigorous part of this, um, this presentation. Okay, so here's another kind of picture where we go up in dimension. And so we are talking about two-dimensional field theories with finite group symmetry. So the sigma is now a three-dimensional theory. And so we're one level up in kind of category number if we make this a fully local theory. And what it attaches to a point is what I introduced earlier, this categorified group algebra or group ring of the finite group G. And here is one of the cases where there's a notion of a regular module. And um, that's this abstract sigma and rho. So if we wanna talk about line defects in this theory, then the line defects that are on rho, well, those end up being just uh, we compute the link again. The link is this interval with the two endpoints given the regular boundary theory. We compute it. We find it's the linear category underlying this fusion category. So it's just vector bundles over G. In particular, you could have a group element in just the one-dimensional vector space. And so that's the typical defect you would see, which is labeled by a group element. But we could have any vector bundle, any kind of combination over here in this categorified group ring. And now if we do the line defects in the, in the middle, in the bulk, sigma, the link is again a circle. And now we know what's attached in this three-dimensional gauge theory, this Turaya-Vero theory. What's attached to the circle is the center, the Drinfeld center of this fusion category. And so these are equivariant vector bundles over G. The simple objects are a pair of a group element and an irreducible representation of the centralizer. And so here the center is bigger, right? In the previous case, the center was a sub of the group, but here the center is bigger. So that's the kind of thing that can happen. All right. So I've gone for an hour, but I, I don't know how long Duvin have. Um, not, not really any problem for me. So just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's a good place to stop for questions then. I mean, would you be able to give like a simple physical description of what these um, defects you get from sigma are? I mean, I think it's clear for the ones labeled by group elements are just, you know, symmetry twists of the theory, but I'm not so clear on this sigma defects, what they mean physically. Um... Well, I don't know quite um, what to say to uh, help with that. I mean, if you think of an ordinary group symmetry, you know, you would, I, I think typically what is said, I'm not going to presume to say what you would say, but typically what's said is that you have a co-dimension one manifold labeled by a group element. And these are the ones labeled by a central group element. So they have additional commutation with, um, other defects, that's one thing to say. But, um, but you also so said there's more, more defects because the center is bigger. Uh, 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 in this case, sorry. Um, I don't know that I have an immediate good physical answer for you. I mean, these really are um, Wilson and Edhoft defects in this theory, this gauge theory. So they translate on the two-dimensional module to something. Um, you know, there's a way to understand, for example, the two-dimensional easing model as being a left module. You see, I haven't in this slide said anything about the left module, about what this symmetry is acting on. This is all in the abstract symmetry theory. But one thing this could act on is the easing model with the group G, spin system with the group G in two dimensions. And these kinds of operators, when they, these defects, when they end on the boundary become uh, order and disorder defects in that theory. But they're, as you see, related to the Wilson and Hoof defects in this uh, symmetry picture. Anyway, I don't think I have a good answer for that. Um, sorry. All right, all right, thanks. All right, so maybe I'll, Try to take 20 more minutes just to show you another ex example. Um, 
which is, uh, you know, so there are other examples in, in the paper we wrote that's on the archive, certainly. And here's one that um, is, is inspired by uh, this paper from a while ago by Aroni, Zyberg, and Tachikawa, which is about four-dimensional gauge theories and about line defects in four-dimensional gauge theories in different um, gauge groups and so on. So let me just say how their story looks uh, in this framework. And I need three um, preliminaries to kind of explain how it goes. I won't have time to really go carefully through the preliminaries, but at least it'll hopefully give you a little introduction and then you can uh, try to read what's there. So the first uh, piece of preliminary is a class of topological theories called finite homotopy theories. That's how we'll understand the symmetry theory here. And it's in that context, it's a kind of semi-classical description of this topological field theory, a finite version of the path integral, and it allows to do computations. So theories like this are a very nice class of theories because you can really compute in them um, semi-classically using topology. Okay. The second, I have to talk about uh, the quotient construction in this context, what was already alluded to. Um, and the third preliminary is to talk about Gauss laws because that's the key point that uh, enters into, into their paper. Okay, so the first little section here is about finite homotopy theories. So here's a definition. So a topological space is called pi finite, pi for homotopy, if it has finitely many path components and each path component uh, wherever you pick, pick a base point, all of the homotopy groups are finite and the homotopy groups vanish above some uh, degree. So loosely it's finite in the sense of homotopy groups. So a first example is an eilenberg maclean space. An eilenberg maclean space um, where we have any degree, but we have a finite group pi. So this would be relevant for what would be called a Q minus one pi symmetry, I guess. So pi has to be an abelian group if Q is bigger than one. And we'll use notation that emphasizes the kind of groups here. So when Q is one and we, the KG one is really the classifying space of the group G. And when Q is larger than one, the group pi is abelian, we'll call it A. Let's say it's finite abelian to be a pi finite space. And this is the classifying space of BQ minus one A. So that's the symmetry and this is the classifying space, which tells you about, if you like the background gauge fields. So here's another example where we have um, a finite group G and a finite abelian group A. And we have some data that ties them together. And we build a space like this, which is not an eilenberg maclean but a two-stage Posnikov system. And this is what you might call the classifying space of a two-group. So again, in this talk, I'm not going to do that, but there are many theories, there are many papers that have shown gauge theories and so on that uh, have this kind of symmetry. And this kind of symmetry can be studied in the context of these finite homotopy theories. So these theories were actually first introduced by Konsevich in a preprint from uh, long ago and developed by Quinn in uh, the first of the Park City summer sessions in the Park City volume, and then Turayev very much and many others. Um, the quantization is by, as I said, this finite path integral, which um, I introduced uh, you know, in thinking about the example of Chern Simon's theory and trying to reconcile the various constructions at that time or manifestations of Chern Simon's theory. And this kind of finite sum, which now takes place in a higher category, those weren't really developed at that time. Um, that notion of finite sum is something that is a topic of very much current interest in applications in chromatic homotopy theory and something a little bit away from field theory. So there's more developments in that direction. Just a remark that this pi finiteness assumption actually only enters at the top level when we wanna make the, a number for an N, M manifold, the top dimensional manifold. 
we can drop that and then we would get a once categorified theory. And this is one of the ways we can get rid of some finiteness uh, and get wider applicability. Okay, so just quickly, how do these finite homotopy theories work? Well, we're going to fix a dimension I'll call M. This M is going to be N plus one in our example, in our application to symmetries of N-dimensional theories. X is our pi finite space. It might be equipped with a co-cycle of degree M like that, but in our example, the co-cycle is zero nonetheless. M is a closed manifold of dimension less than or equal to M on which we want to quantize. And I'll use this notation for the mapping space. So basically the fields are maps from M to X, a kind of Sigma model, but this X is a very abstract, you know, it's a kind of big topological space. So we're not trying to do anything like a measure here. We're summing in quantizing in a homotopical sense. So let me, for definiteness, take the example that arises in this paper we'll discuss of Aroni, Seiberg, and Tachikawa, which is to say this X is this eilenberg mclean space, um, maps into it you can think of as A gerbs. So it's encoding a BA symmetry, a one-form A symmetry. There's no co-cycle. The co-cycle in that context would be an Hooft anomaly. There is none. And the dimension is five because we're going to be looking at symmetries of a four-dimensional theory. So if we want a number on a five manifold, then what we end up doing is summing over these fields. So we're summing over the maps, but we're just summing over the path components and we're weighting them by symmetry, which is the same way you weight, when you weight a sum over Feynman diagrams, you always weight by one over the number of automorphisms. So this is that term, that's one over the number of automorphisms. But in this case, you have automorphisms of automorphisms, gauging for gauging, however you want to say it. And so there's a compensation there, a further compensation. So this is the way that you can count and get a local counting. And it works out to be this simple expression in this case. Okay, if we go to co-dimension one, so that's a four manifold in our five dimensional theory, we want to produce a vector space. And what is the vector space? We're just going to take the space of functions on the space of fields. That's our vector space. That's what we usually do, except again, we want something more homotopical. So we want really locally constant functions. So those end up being, of course, functions, just one number for each path component. In co-dimension two, we'll get a category. Let's say we'll choose to get a category. We could get algebras of some sort instead. And what we'll take is the category of vector bundles over this mapping space. So now these vector bundles, again, should be local systems or flat vector bundles. And what that means is that um, we not only have a vector bundle, but we have an action of pi one. You see every loop acts, but if I deform the loop a little bit, then the, the automorphism I get of the fiber there doesn't change. That's the sense in which it's topological. And so what we get then is, you know, at this point, we get a representation of the fundamental group based at that point. So in this example, this is what we get. And then we want to quantize bordisms. The, correlation functions, linear maps, and so on. And that we do by looking at this um, correspondence of mapping spaces. If we have a bordism like this, I should have drawn. Then if we have a field on the whole thing, we can restrict to the incoming boundary, we can restrict to the outgoing boundary, and that's what these two restriction maps are. And we'll do a usual kind of pull push, where this push is really the finite, the homotopy version of the Feynman path integral. Okay, so we're going to need to know about boundaries and defects in these theories. And just as these quantities in sigma have semi-classical versions, that's what this quantization is about, so too do boundaries and uh, defects. And so, okay, if we have this X and we can in general have a co-cycle, won't be there in our example, then a, um, the data you need to give a boundary theory is you need another pi finite space and you need a map like this. 
And if we have the co-cycle, then we have to trivialize the pullback of the co-cycle. So again, I'm going at warp speed just to give you an overview. I don't expect you to um, necessarily absorb it, but just to say that, um, that this is the data you can use, you can make an appropriate mapping space where the bulk is mapping into X as before, but on the boundary, you have a lift of the map to this Y, and that's the boundary data. So for example, the regular boundary theory, imagine that X is BG, we're summing over G bundles. On the boundary, we want to trivialize the G bundle. That's the gauge fixing. So that can be expressed in this language, and that leads to nice computations, as I'll illustrate. And then I'll just say that there's a version of that for defects of, of higher co-dimension, not necessarily boundaries or domain walls, but for defects of higher co-dimension, we can again encode the defect by a map of spaces. And if there's a co-cycle, we have to do something with the co-cycle. I just want to say that even if the co-cycle is zero, this defect or boundary could have this uh, mu. The mu was supposed to be a trivialization of something, but if that co-cycle is zero, instead of being a trivialization, it's itself a co-cycle of a lower degree. And so that can give extra data. It's like having a boundary where you sum with weights. In some contexts, that might be called a discrete torsion, for example. The lambda would as well. OK, so now again, I'll just go to overview mode, I'm afraid. And so the quotient construction, if we first look at the quotient in algebra, going back to algebras as inspiration, then the quotient, the data to give a quotient is what's called an augmentation of the algebra. So an augmentation is a algebra map to the ground field. And if we take this um, sandwich where we put not the regular module on as a right module, but we put this augmentation, then that implements the quotient. So again, we had this presentation of our vector space V that's telling V has the symmetries encoded by the algebra A. And now we have the definition of the quotient. This is really a definition, which is to make this sandwich, this mixing construction with the augmentation. So the augmentation is telling us how to take a quotient. And so here's an example that shows you why it's a quotient. There are higher versions of augmentations, and it's important that augmentations don't necessarily exist. And that non-existence is really in the physics saying that the symmetry has an Hooft anomaly. Therefore, you can't take quotients. You can't gauge. So in the field theory context, this quotient, again, is all happening in the topological piece. We just need a different right module for sigma. And again, it may not exist. That's the Hooft anomaly situation. So we know what an augmentation is if we're in the situation where we know what a regular module is. And um, these are called Neumann boundary th uh, theories. They don't always exist. And again, we have a left module. So we have this symmetry sigma rho acting on F. Then we can form the quotient if we have this augmentation by forming this sandwich. And as I said, that's a definition now of the quotient. So that's a little fast, but hopefully that gives you some idea of how we form quotients and that that is happening again in this topological part of the theory. Now, what is the higher Gauss law? Well, what is the lower Gauss law first? So supposing we're doing a quantization as before in co-dimension one in one of these finite homotopy situations. So we're going to be quantizing this mapping space and we want to take the locally constant functions on it. That's the usual quantization when we don't have a twisting or we don't have a co-cycle at all. But if we're in a situation where we have the co-cycle, then the data that co-cycle gives is a complex line bundle over this mapping space in co-dimension one. And it's a flat bundle. It's a local system. And what we want to do to quantize is take the space of flat sections. So what does that mean? It means that we really replace the space by its fundamental groupoid. So now we need pi one as well as pi zero. And um, now what we want to do, we have a line bundle over this groupoid. 
and we want to take these sections. So here's the picture of some point in the groupoid. We have this fiber, we want to take sections, but we have this pi one, and we have to take sections, a point here, which is invariant under the action of pi one. So this co-cycle might give us a non-trivial character by which pi one acts on this line. And if the character is non-zero, uh, not the identity, then the only fixed point is zero. And that means the section vanishes. And that's a kind of selection rule that tells us that this path component won't contribute to the quantization if this character is non the identity. So that's the Gauss law is the selection rule that's telling us because of the action of that character, we might knock out some components when we quantize. And I just want to say that, um, okay, that when we do this quantization in co-dimension two, where we get a linear category, there's a similar phenomenon, but now it doesn't just involve pi one, it involves pi two as well. So in that situation, we wanted to quantize by taking the linear category of flat vector bundles. That's fine if we don't have a co-cycle, but if we have a co-cycle, we get an analog over the mapping space in co-dimension two of a complex line bundle. It's the next level up. It's what you might call a bundle of invertible vect modules, I don't know. And it's a bundle of these categories. It's again, a local system. And again, we want to take flat sections. And now you have to worry not only about paths between them, that's the kind of pi one, but also maps between paths, which is the pi two. And the picture. Yeah, so if you're at a point where there's no pi one, then you're just acting by the identity, then these pi twos, these elements of pi two, they act as automorphisms of the identity functor here. And they act by a character of pi two. And again, that character needs to be trivial in order for this to contribute. So again, I'm out of time. So it's just an overview, but to tell you that there's some higher Gauss law. So now let me at least give you just the raw setup in, in our context of their paper. And so it's this example again, where you have a um, compact Lie group and a finite subgroup of its center, and we'll call H bar the quotient group, and we're presenting some H gauge theory, which has this BA symmetry. We're presenting it as this sandwich on the boundary of this um, five dimensional gerb theory, a gerb theory, where what goes here is the corresponding gauge theory for the quotient group. And what goes here is the regular boundary theory, which I told you has this semi classical uh, avatar, so we can compute with it. Okay. So now we want to take other theories. Basically, we want to look at gauge theories, not just for the group H, not just for the quotient H bar, but for any Lie group in between, where we mod out by subgroups of the center. And so we need these right modules, which I told you are given by a map like this and a trivialization of the co-cycle, which means we just get a four co-cycle on Y. So for any subgroup, we can make a map like this of the gerbs for A prime to the gerbs for A. And now we want a co-cycle. And this group of co-cycles was computed in the 1950s actually by Eilenberg and McLean to be the group of these quadratic functions or quadratic functions on the subgroup A prime. So that's this general story. In this case, we see that what we need to specify is a quadratic function for this class of boundary theories. And so if we have a pair consisting of a subgroup and a quadratic function, we get a right module and we can form the sandwich. And the sandwich then is some new four dimensional theory. It's a four dimensional H mod A prime gauge theory with that gauge group. And the Q will determine some um, you know, particular version of that theory. In fact, what that Q gives rise to is a cohomology operation, this Pontryagin square, and that Pontryagin square is what appears in the Lagrangian description of that gauge theory, this sandwich gauge theory. So what we want to study, what's studied in this paper are line defects in this theory. And again, I'm just going to flash these slides because I'm cognizant of the time and your time. But 
this is analogous to this picture in quantum mechanics where we study a point defect here. In general, it's given by this line across here and then the boundary data. And we have to give data first in the bulk here of the defect and then on the boundary. And that's similar here. We have a, a curve in the four dimensional boundary. We take the product. So we get the surface sitting in this um, five dimensional bulk and then ending on these boundary curves. And to tell the defect, we have to give a label, if you like, in the interior and then a label in each of these boundaries. So the interior and this boundary, those are topological and that's where the information will come from. We're not going to use anything about what's sitting here. So again, it's a topological computation. So for the bulk label, um, the, the link is a two sphere. We have to get an object in here. We do this kind of quantization. And what we see is that we have to get a linear category for each pair consisting of an element of A appearing like this and an element of A check appearing like this, the punch Briagan dual or the characters. And these are sometimes called discrete kind of magnetic and electric charges. And so we get these linear categories, which are kind of the abstract thing. And now we have to compute what happens on this defect D. And I'll just say that it's a computation that you can do, as I said, with, um, with topology, where we're looking at some kinds of diagrams of mapping spaces and we have to compute. And what we find is that the kinds of defects that can occur, meaning the M's and the E's that can occur, have to obey some selection rule. And the selection rule tells you that the M has to lie in the subgroup of A. Remember the M is an element of A, but with this boundary theory, it has to lie there. And then the E has to satisfy a certain equation as well. So I don't have time to do it. I'll just say that this selection rule is the selection rule in their paper. And here it's derived from uh, the symmetry and just computing in this abstract symmetry using some of the tools that we have in topological field theory. So I think that's probably a good place to stop. Thank you for your attention and forbearance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. You, you also have a summary slide? Nope. No, oh, okay, great. That's the last slide. Oh, cool. There's no summary. Any, no problem. Any question from the audience, comments? Sorry, in, in the example of the four dimensional gauge theory, uh, suppose F is a gauge theory for a, a centerless gauge group like PSUM, then F tilde and F are the same theory. Well, I, I mean, it's just that that theory won't have the symmetry, that's all. I mean, um... but I mean, PSUM, uh, four dimensional PSUM gauge theory. As a magnetic one for symmetry. So, in well, okay. Um, sorry, I always have to translate magnetic and electric, but yes. So then it will sit on the boundary of this, but it'll sit in a different way. And yes, I think you're right that in that case, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't want to commit, then I, I think you're right that it will be that gauge theory. But again, it's not enough. You see, if I tell you that the rotation group, just SO2 acts on some three-dimensional vector space. It's not enough to tell you the three-dimensional vector space. I have to give you the way that that rotation group acts, right? I have to give you an axis and so on. So just to tell me that what sits on the boundary is also that gauge theory is not enough. You have to tell me how the symmetry acts. So saying that that's a magnetic whatever symmetry, that's going to be encoded in how that theory sits on the boundary. Does that make sense? So it's not enough just to say it's that theory. I have to tell you how it sits on the boundary of that sigma. Yeah, I see. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just confused by, yeah, I, I'm not understanding whether in this case you are really describing the, the magnetic symmetry or not with the, with the topological field theory in, in bulk. This is what's called the center symmetry. I don't, is yeah, that electric or magnetic? I dictionary I because I think I, I understand what he means. If you start with SUN, you can gauge the what is called the electric one-form symmetry. 
it's actually misleading to call it a center symmetry for a variety of reasons, but it does act as the center in this particular case. And then what you get is a PSUN gauge theory. If alternatively you start with PSUN, you have non-trivial bundles and they are characterized by a one-form magnetic symmetry. And if you gauge the latter, you find back the SUN theory. Now you can do more interesting thing by adding this discrete torsion that you mentioned. And then we can get PSUN with this Pontryagin square that you mentioned. I hope if what I just said is meaningful to the two of you, then I hope I could bridge the gap. Yes, thank you. And if you look in our paper, by the way, this idea of when you take the quotient or gauging by that symmetry without the uh, co-cycle, then the resulting theory has a dual symmetry of the Pontryagin yeah. dual group shifted in the appropriate way, which is yeah, what- that, That's always the case. Yeah, yeah. And then if you gauge that again, case. you get back the originals. So that's, again, a computation, a theorem, really, in the topological part of the theory, and that's spelled out. I mean, yes, it's standard, of course, but I, I'm just saying you can see that in um, in this picture in the topological field theory. You, you can, there's a more elementary version of that in the context of overfolds, that if you have a system with a say finite symmetry group G, if you gauge it and create the overfold, the overfold has what is known as a magnet, as a quantum symmetry that acts on the various twisted sectors. And then if you gauge that, you can get back to the original theory. And the four-dimensional example with SUN gauge theories is essentially the same as the two-dimensional example with the overfold. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I just want to say that, again, that those are um, theorems, if you like, about the abstract symmetry that apply to any theory on which it acts. Right? So those are manipulations you can make in the topological field theories. That is the summary slide, if you like, that message. I have a question. If you start with a um, with a some relative theory, say sixty two comma zero SCFTs, is there abstraction to finding an isomorphism theta to find an absolute theory f? Uh, well, okay. I I think in that case, okay. So remember that what we're calling symmetry this abstract symmetry is a sigma together with a row. Now there are topological field theories sigma, which do not admit any topological boundary theory row. For example, in three dimensions, there are churn simons theories that typically don't admit a topological um, boundary theory. So I think that if we were to write a seven dimensional theory on which this six dimensional uh, to zero theory lives on the boundary, then that seven dimensional theory won't, I think, admit a topological boundary theory. And so I wouldn't call that um, symmetry. So just sitting on the boundary of another theory is not what we're calling symmetry. The row is part of the structure, it's sigma and rho together. So uh, I think that's the case. Thanks for the question, because that illuminates that point. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I wonder. Uh, I wonder. Can you consider uh, the fusion? Uh, when when both uh, rho and uh, um, f total are both gapless. Do you consider this type of fusion? Fusion, you mean this uh, mixing or sandwich dimension? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, there's no reason that um, the F tilde has to be um, has to be uh, non-topological. The F tilde can be a topological field theory as well. And even if we're studying an F, which is not topological, but we look at it at long 
distance, we flow in the infrared, then if F is gapped, then we might think that it flows to a topological field theory. And if that F is presented as this rho sigma F tilde, then we might hope that what the theory F flows to is also presented as rho sigma some other theory. And that other theory would be a left module that's topological. And so now we're at the question of what left modules are there for that sigma, and there might be constraints and so on. And so that's where you'll learn something about your original theory by um, applying that kind of topological field theory. So then, yes, then the whole problem becomes topological. So definitely that's a situation that one wants to look at. And in the paper, uh, we explain in this kind of framework, we just explain some examples that are in some recent papers of what are called duality defects, where that kind of logic is applied. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Actually, uh, today's lecture does not mention much about non-invertible symmetry or duality defect. So we'll, we'll then like to make some connection or make some comment about that. Well, the non-invertible symmetry um, is here. I mean, this is all about algebras of symmetries and the defects we're talking about need not be um, invertible. So for example, the line defects that we're talking about here these line defects certainly aren't um, in general invertible. As far as the, um, sorry, what was the other one? Uh, duality oh, defect. Oh, the duality defect. No, um, I didn't talk about duality defects. Duality defects come when you um, have an augmentation epsilon and you have this row. And then it turns out there are some canonical, typically canonical domain walls between them in both directions that you could compose. And the duality defect comes when you have separately an isomorphism of this quotient theory with the original theory F. And then this defect composed with that isomorphism becomes a self domain wall of F. And that's called a duality defect. You could compute again what happens with it based on these defects. And there's a story like that. So no, I didn't talk about that. Um, today, but uh, there's um, the paper certainly talks about that. Okay, thank you. And the lecture notes as well, but I chose to, well, in this case, rush through <laughs> this Aroni uh, uh, Zyberg um, Tachikawa example, just because I think that's familiar to many people. And I thought I would just show how these selection rules <laughs> emerge from these topological computations. I mean, they're not necessarily, you know, the most straightforward, but you have to do something. But nonetheless, you can derive these uh, selection rules. Um, here, here is a question. Um, so um, if I understand correctly, your theory is about, um, um, like uh, some some domain wall that is a uh, topological, or maybe some some higher uh, co-dimensional defect that that is a kind of topological boundary condition, and and you mentioned that for some theory there is a uh, an obstruction to have topological boundary condition. So I'm wondering whether in higher dimension you you can there there are theories with uh, an obstruction to have topological um, higher co-dimensional boundary condition? I think I'm not sure what you mean by higher co-dimension boundary condition. Are you meaning higher dimensional defects? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, as I said, a defect lives in the category HOM from one <clears throat> to whatever the theory attaches to, um, you know, typically a sphere of some dimension. And mm -hmm. There, you know, it's a question in the fully local topological theory to understand what that looks like. And 
I, I don't know, even for the boundary case, I don't know an obstruction theory written this way. In other ways, of course, there are expressions for anomalies and so on. But even in algebra, never mind anything about field theory, if you give me an algebra, I don't think I know an obstruction theory to having an augmentation. I think that's a general question in algebra for which I don't think there's you know, kind of algorithmic obstruction theory. And the analogous question in field theory is the one you're asking. So are there examples? Yes, we can certainly manufacture examples, um, artificial or not. I, I think we could manufacture examples. But um, yeah, I don't know a systematic uh, obstruction theory for for having these. Uh, so, so for example, if we uh, people suppose we talk about the uh, uh, transaminal theory, which you you said don't admit uh, topological boundary condition, is there? Uh, in that case, uh, people know some kind of uh, obstruction theory, is it? Well, I mean. Yes, you, you can find concrete obstructions in that case. You can say, supposing there is a boundary theory, what can you deduce? And one result along those lines, um, which I think incorporates others, is uh, in a paper that Konstantin Telemann and I wrote, uh, you know, where we axiomatized what kinds of theories these are, these Reshtik and Terai of three-dimensional theories, and we um, axiomatize what they'll look like being fully local, and we prove a theorem, you know, using the uh, tools of topological field theory, we prove a theorem that tells you in slogan terms that if such a theory, a Reshtik and Terayev theory, admits a topological boundary theory, then that Reshtik and Terayev theory is in fact a Terayev Vero theory. I mean, that's the shape of the theorem, but it needs all the technical hypotheses to become a theorem. So, um, you know, that's an example where we have a theorem, but I don't, in general, all I can say is I don't know an obstruction theory. Yeah. I see. Thanks. Then, then do you think it's a, a hopeful, like a, when one can expect to develop sim similar theories for like a defect, whether there's a topological kind of defect? Uh, I don't know. I don't think I've thought enough to have a, to weigh in on that. Thanks. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, uh, can I go back to the previous page, the page before this? Uh, one second and wait for my next meeting. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, in, in this previous page of this one. Uh, can previous, you... this one? Oh, no, can you go further, previous? Uh, the one you compute uh, uh, the fusion of uh, higher dimensional defect. Oh, maybe it's, maybe the later, or maybe I, I go the wrong direction. Oh, maybe, maybe this is good enough. So I wonder, I wonder that in general, if you have a complete uh, description, yeah, uh, if you have a complete description of the topological defect on sigma, or uh, and the uh, complete de description of topological defect on the. Uh, 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 F two auto, then you should be able to define the fusion uh, categorically, right? As Which a fusion, fusion do you mean? What um, do you mean by fusion in that? By uh, fusion, I mean um, squeeze uh, squeeze the sigma to to get F. Ah, uh, do the tensor product. Well, okay. categorically. Um, where's uh, right? Sorry, so. I just found some picture. So you're imagining that we present the theory F like this. And, um, and then you're asking if I have a defect here, maybe supported on whatever kind of manifold, how do I compute its image under theta as a defect in F? Is that the question? Um, uh, not really. I, I, I mean, if you know all the defect of uh, rho, uh, all the defect in the sigma, uh, and know there and all the defect in F total. If you uh, uh, you can define uh, know the category of defect of them, you can define the fusion categorically as a tensor product, right? You can also compute in that way. But it seems that you you uh, 
is, is your way of competition uh, carried out in, in that categorical way or? Um... Well, I, I think, I think you're asking, can you make a higher category of defects out of say the topological piece of this? Can we take yeah, yeah. all the defects and make the structure of some higher category? Yeah. And I think maybe, maybe not, I'm not going to say what, I mean, I don't know because I haven't tried to do that carefully. I, I think the point of view, though, I will comment, is that in thinking about these defects, the idea here is not to say, well, we're taking in F some topological defects and making that, or all topological defects, but rather we're taking the structure, sigma rho, of a field of a topological field theory and a topological boundary theory, and that's the structure that abstractly expresses the symmetry not some category of defects, but the sigma rho is abstractly, you know, the analog, as I said, of an algebra, of having an algebra that you want to act on something. Mm -hmm. And the analog of the elements, which are going to give you operators in the algebra case, but that are going to give you, well, depending in the field theory, they'll give you defects in the field theory, which could be operators, they could be you know, defects in the sense of singularities, whatever. Those are then the topological ones are the defects in the sigma rho, not organized in some other way. They're organized the same way elements of an algebra are organized into an algebra. The defects are part of the topological field theory. So it's the structure of topological field theory doing the organizing and giving the, the, the foundation and framework for computing with those defects. So, so from that point of view, I don't see the gain of trying to organize the defects into yet a different kind of structure. What I'm advocating okay. for is that the organizing the defects as part of the sigma rho in the topological field theory is an effective way to organize the defects and to compute with them geometrically. That's what I'm trying to illustrate here with some of okay. those examples and there are more in the papers. So that's really the point of view, I think, if that I see. makes sense. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, maybe one more comment. If just an analog in Riemannian geometry, if I look at, for example, the two sphere, the round two sphere, we can ask the question, what are all the isometries of the two sphere, the self symmetries of that geometric structure? Well, we know the answer. And we know that if we take an abstract Riemannian manifold, the general Riemannian manifold, there's a theorem that when we take all the isometries that they make up the points of a Lie group. We can give that set of, of isometries the structure of a Lie group, and we know some things about that Lie group. That's a theorem that's not trivial at all in Riemannian geometry. And uh, on the other hand, what's much simpler is to say the group SO2 acts on the two-sphere by isometries by such and such rotations. That concept just requires basic definitions about Lie groups and basic definitions about Riemannian manifolds. It doesn't require the deep theorem of organizing all the symmetries into a Lie group. And so what we're doing here is the analog of that. We're saying, what does it mean for sigma rho to act? We're not saying, what are all the symmetries of F, you see? And that's a much easier thing to say. And to Dominique's question, it doesn't require that you know anything in detail about an, a quantum field theory that's not topological, because we're not saying something about that. In a sub, I mean, we are saying something about it, but we're not using computations there. We're just using computations, what would amount in that other situation to knowing what an abstract Lie group is, but not knowing you know, what a Riemannian manifold is. So I don't know if that clarifies, but that tells you where this sits, perhaps. Uh, thank you. Uh, but I think uh, this philosophy can also be generalized by uh, generalized F to be relative in your sense, right? If ah, F certainly. is also a relative, then uh, rho can be a domain wall between sigma and other sigma. No, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, I don't know if I have all the colors. Yeah, if we start <laughs> with um, F, which is sitting on the boundary of some, uh, I don't know, some alpha maybe, right? So that F is a left module for some alpha. And now we want to say, what does it mean for this to have the symmetry sigma rho, the same symmetry? 
then I think we have to take, um, what's the picture? So we have to take F tilde, which will now live on the boundary <coughs> of sigma tensor alpha. And then we're going to have the row. So sigma and row were the same as before. And that row is now going to be a row tensor alpha. And you see that's now a domain wall between sigma tensor alpha and rho. And so it's that that needs to be isomorphic. So the picture exactly of what you said is this, that we start with an F that's relative or a boundary theory for some alpha. The alpha need not be topological either, by the way. And then what does it mean for sigma rho to act? It means this, that we make this picture and we have an isomorphism as boundary theories for, whoops, I used the wrong symbol there. That should have been an alpha. A, uh, alpha. That was an alpha, maybe. Yeah, that, I think that's what you were saying. Yes. And in the case when alpha is invertible, that's when we would say this is the picture of the anomaly of F, and that would be then having that symmetry again. Yeah, exactly. Good. Yeah. Thanks. All right, thank you. Well, I think it's about the time. So we should thank Dan for the wonderful lecture and seminar. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again, Jovan, for inviting